What's going on everybody? Shona Express here, coming to you with the very first delivery of the Shona Express podcast. With me today, I have Irrelevant. Hey Irrelevant will be my co-host for these podcasts, hopefully for the foreseeable future. What we want to do with these podcasts is pretty much talk about what's going on in Weekly Shonen Jump with all of the different series that are, are currently serialized in Jump and kind of talk about where the magazine is going and stuff like that, as well as our own little, you know, fun conversations based on the stories that we read and the stories that we really like from Weekly Shonen Jump. Um... So part of that is we, we want to go through all the chapters that we both read. Now, we don't read the same amount of chapters. So I read a lot of the magazine. I'm, I believe currently I'm not caught up on Haikyuu, but I'm, I'm working on getting caught up on that right now. And we never learn. I'm not caught up on those two manga. And Irrelevant, you have several more that you're not caught up on. What are, what are the ones that you're – that you – well, let's go over. What are the ones that you do read? So I've got ten under my belt right now. I am current on One Piece, Mission Yazakura Family, Guardian of the Witch, The Promised Neverland, My Hero Academia, Matama Security. I mess up that title all the time. Um, well, that's right. You ah, got it. Got it. Mash Lee, Magic and Muscle, A Gravity Boys, Undead Unluck, Zip Man. I think that's all 10, yeah. Yeah, so so what we're going to do is this first part, we're going to go over all the ones that we both read. We're going to go over those together. Then you'll take a little break while I go over the ones that, that only I read. And then we'll come back together at the end and talk about how we thought, you know, where we rank each of these chapters along with the countdown corner. Um, which is just, you know, we come up with a topic every week and we, we talk about that topic. So... I'm excited. I'm excited to get to get going here, but we'll start with the most popular one that we've both read this week, or at least the highest in the table of contents this week, which is One Piece, and rightfully so, might I say. So, before we before we get started, first thoughts, just overall brief thoughts. It was amazing. I was moved. I saw some of it coming, and I was like, "Yes, guest fulfillment." All in all, ten out of ten chapter. Oh, it was really good. It was definitely really good. First of all, though, before we get super into it, I want to talk about this cover page story. Can we please be done with this Lola, trying to find Lola in Dressrosa with the fire tank pirates? We need to be done with this. I'm not excited about it ever. I I really don't pay any attention to it. I just like, I, I pay attention enough to be like, oh, still on Capone Beige's life. I really hope Oda makes it super relevant later so that I can kick myself properly for not paying attention to it, but it feels like the longest running cover page story he's had. Yeah, I don't know if it is, but it definitely feels like it. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're, you're right about that. But So going forward, kind of going through through the chapter just a little bit, um, so one of the things I want to talk about is uh, Odin's family. And their various reactions to what's going on. So we see a little page of them in the beginning. Toki is very composed for what's happening. I mean, she's just going on like it's any other day. Um, and like, I mean, obviously we see Momo is very upset because he understands what's going on. Hiori, it doesn't look like she understands what's happening. Um, but like, why is... Toki's so stoic. I don't think she's stoic about it. I just think that she's keeping composed because she knows that that's what she has to do. I think it's a mixture of being strong for her family and, and staying ready to act. Like, now is not the time to lose her head, even though it is the time that would make the most sense. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, but... She wouldn't, you'll want to lose her head. I, I like seeing Momo kind of understand. Momo is of the age where he, he ought to understand. How old, he's like, what is he, like seven or eight now? That sounds right. Like, yeah. it's been five years since they came back. So yeah, it's, it's he's probably seven or eight. But, so he's, uh, so it makes sense that he's crying. Hiori, not quite old enough. It doesn't really understand what's going on. Um, but they have like this poison tester guy just eating their food. It's, it's sad. It's sad to see the fam like they are. 
And then we see the pot of boiling oil. Um, and we're told it's oil, not water, for the explicit purpose of you dying quicker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was terrifying. Um, but, so Odin kind of, he says, I request that you give me a chance. Um, it's, it's imperative that I survive. So, like, Odin, Odin is, like, asking for this, this last, like, fighting chance? Which is weird. I, I don't know if, like, maybe I missed something or I didn't understand this, Or maybe I don't understand something about Japanese culture and their executions. But it's it seemed weird to me that he... Because he clearly feels like he is owed this. Like, this last chance of survival. I'm, I don't know. Yeah. Did you think anything about that? or? I mean, it took me a minute to realize, like, who is, was talking there. But for him to request that, I mean... I almost get that he thinks... It's fair that he'd be given a chance, considering what happens, like, what we learn later on in this chapter, like, the whole what the deal was, so... Ah, uh, sure, yeah, maybe that's part of it. But, I mean, we see that the oil is so hot, <laughs> that guy falls in, and he, like, immediately bursts into flames, yeah. and, like, melts. Gotta, so it's, it's definitely there. it's definitely super hot. And so Kaido, of course, is like, spend one hour in the pot. I like why he says an hour. It's not like an arbitrary number. He says, like, that's enough time that someone would get lightheaded in, like, a bath. And so, like, there's just no possible way he should be able to survive the hour, is what Kaido's saying. Yeah. He's like, if you were taking, like, a normal bath, you wouldn't be able to, you'd pass out. Yeah. So that... Yeah, it's super cool, though, like, what Odin's plan is, what he sets up to do. He is he is a buff boy, by the way. Odin is a uh, is a jacked man. And he's, like, super big, too. Like, next to the guard, like, Odin is huge. Oh, yeah, he's a monster, for sure. Odin is definitely a, he's a, he's a big man. He's a big boy, for sure. But, I, so then let's, let's talk about the plan. Let's talk about the plan, the amazing panel. Um, where he's in the oil and everybody else is on top of him. Yeah, he's holding up all of his vessels. And they're all... I love, to uh, their reactions. They don't want him to do it. And then I like how just a little bit later, one of them dares to say, like, how it's a bit hot or something on top. And they the other vassals yell at him because Odin is, you know, in the oil, burning <laughs> alive to keep them safe. Yeah, they're like, oh, it's it's crazy. So, like, it's like we have not seen anywhere near the full hour pass. The last, I think the last marker we got was the four-minute mark. Yeah, Was yeah. the last mark that we, we saw before Shinobu starts, you know, says the backstory. I don't want to get into that yet, but I, um, this is a, this is a really, really good plan. By Odin, I think. I mean, it's crazy to think that he could withstand this, but, like, as long as he does, which I feel like we can confidently say he will, then then everybody else gets to go free. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, he knows he's that strong, and also he's got the motivation to protect his, his men who have been with him, his people. So, yeah, it's a really good plan, and I like how Orochi is so ticked off about it and Kaido is just thinking it's the best thing ever. I really liked how again it just it goes back to show we're we're getting shown like Kaido's a pirate and he like he is here for his own amusement and that's why he's he does everything he does. Which is a very pirate mentality. I love how yeah Orochi is like wait a minute they're not touching the oil and Kaido's like so what they're in the pot I think it's nifty like Kaido is like genuinely impressed by Odin at this point and Orochi is like kill them all which I mean we came to find out why Orochi's like that yeah yeah which I guess I guess we can get into that so Shinobu somebody's like Oh, the stupid lord. He's a fool of a lord. She, like, loses it on the crowd. Shinobu is awesome. Way cooler than I thought she was. And the thing that I think that this showed me about Shinobu is, like, remember, I don't know if you remember, but earlier in Wano, in the Wano arc, where they're talking about the traitor, and she's arguing with Law. 
saying like one of your men, since they were in prison, could be the traitor. And Law was like, shut up. My men aren't like that. And got angry and stormed off. And she kind of like lost it. This has got to be why. Like, I mean, this has been her role even here. And so to think like for 20 years, she this is this is the last time she saw a lot of these people. And for 20 years, she's been waiting to, to you know, initiate a plan to take back Wano. So, of course, she has all this fire and his anger in her. I just, I, I, I like her more now. I think that her character is, I'm less on Law's side, right? Because I think in the beginning I was like, yeah, the Heart Pirates wouldn't ever betray Law. But, like, now I'm like, no, I get why Shinobu's yelling. I understand. Yeah, I don't really remember that as much, but it certainly adds a depth to her character and, and shows the burden that she's been bearing because of what she had to witness, you know, with with Odin. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely is really cool. I, I also like in the flashback, it's not said, but we get to see that Odin and Kaido were fighting in the palace. That, that they fought a little bit. In the pal- like before the big war, when they when he was making that decision with Orochi, mm-hmm. like and I was like, so they squared up beforehand, and Odin then could determine how you know how great are my chances of just blasting through him, how great are my chances of taking him down, and when he sees that he's about equal to him, which I think they're about equal right now. Well, I think in that flashback, like because Kaido acknowledges later on that before in their big battle. That Odin could have beaten him then. So I think there was Odin second-guessing himself and then letting Orochi's words get into his head. And he thought that the way to do this would be peacefully by making himself the fool. But And, and that would have worked. Do you think it was a bad plan of Odin? Or are you on board with Odin's decision? His decision here to say, yeah, I'll make a fool of myself for five years. With the assumption that you guys, every time I dance, you'll release a hundred people, and after five years, you all, when your ships are completed, you all will leave. Do you think it was a bad? It was a bad deal, or do you think it was good? Should he have made it or not? I mean, it's hard to say, like, because the people were tied up and everything like that, so he couldn't guarantee protecting them. You know, if he chose to fight through it, so I do get wanting to like. You know, with that guarantee, but still that was putting a lot of foolish trash, trust in Orochi and in Kaido. So, like, I wish that he had been a little more nefarious, I guess, where he's doing this five-year plan. But also, you know, building up a counterbalance so that if Kaido betrayed him, there was, you know, he had something up his sleeve. Because here's what I'm thinking, right? So we fast forward to present day. And we have all those samurai that they have, you know? The supposed, uh, what is it, like 4,000 or something? They have a bunch of people from Wano that are going to fight with them, you know? Mm -hmm. If he would have, like, while he's dancing, quietly been like, yo, this is the plan, guys. Like, this is what's going on. And building up that army, that whole fight would have gone different. I mean, 11 of them took on, like, 1,000 pirates. And they lost, but not that badly. Yeah, yeah. So, like it wasn't a swamp. Like Yeah, so it could have it could have gone differently if we had maybe planned a little better and not been so trusting. Yeah, I, I think it was a good deal though. I do actually think that, that Odin you know, it he he should although I think you're right though. He he was a pirate for years. You know, he sailed with Whitebeard and then with Roger. He should know that pirates are inherently not trustworthy. There is no reason he should have just out the gate trusted Kaido, you know? Yeah. So So I, I think you might be right about that. Maybe this was a this was a, a sour deal our boy was I mean it's definitely a sour deal now. But maybe it wasn't the best. It definitely it definitely pulled out the heartstrings though, because of what Odin's mm. sacrifice is and being ridiculed by the people and Shinobu just loses it. And I like I love her ending line. So tell me yeah. again, who are you calling a fool of a lord? Yeah, because Odin is a flipping hero. He is. He is definitely a flipping hero. I so that brings me to my like final kind of question about One Piece this week. 
Did you so throughout this flashback, have you been pro Odin or or not so much for him? Have you liked him or not? Because I think the One Piece community has a certain answer. I'm just interested since you don't watch like you don't watch any One Piece analysis videos at all, right? Like no. on online or anything. I'm interested to see what your take on it is. Like if this chapter wasn't a thing, right? What what's your what's your stance on Odin? If you didn't see this yet, I don't know if you can actually accurately answer that, but I did mean, you like him or not? I've enjoyed him throughout. He feels just like super buff samurai Luffy. Like, let's be honest. He's a powerful goofball who, like, I don't know. I feel like follows, like, his whims a little more. But he's got, you know, more refined, like, decorum. I guess you could say. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. So so you, you would say you have been pro um, Odin then? Yeah. Yeah, I've liked him the whole time. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I definitely have been pro Odin, but I think that the One Piece community as a whole has been um, typically um, anti-Odin. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just watching videos and like a lot of people like sleep on Odin a lot. And they're like, you know, he's not they didn't think he was the best until this chapter. And then they're like, Oh, now I understand. And I'm like, shut up. We I understood from the beginning. This man was when he was boiling or cooking Odin over a dude's ashes, I was like, yo, this guy's cool. Yeah, I mean, he always seemed cool, but, like, whenever he started doing, like, the dancing, like, a full thing, I knew that there was some sort of deeper meaning, deeper promise going on there. So, yeah, I've always been Team Odin. I'm glad he's finally getting the recognition he deserves. Yeah. But, I mean, this was an amazing chapter this week for sure. So, one of the best in a while, I would say. But, so it was really good. But do you have anything else to say on One Piece? No. All right, we will move on then to the next most popular this week, or the next highest on the table of contents, which is The Promised Neverland. We got chapter 167 this week. Initial thoughts, just out the gate. What do you got, Irrelevant? Um, I liked it. I, I, I have some issues with when fight scenes span multiple chapters, I start to get... A little annoyed. I know it's a part of manga that I just need to, you know, really embrace and hold tight. But it gets to me. So, like, I wish we were moving forward a little bit more. But I also like where we're headed. It's clear the kids came in with a plan. It was pretty dope. You just, uh, you have trouble reading week to week. That's what I'm hearing. You don't like, you don't like reading. Because, like, I think when you go back and, like, since I collect the volumes, well, you know, you could see it. But when we go back and reread this... It won't feel super long, but because it's been weeks and we, you know, this this it feels longer. You know, that's how a lot of these fight scenes are in in manga and anime. The longer you do this, you know, the the longer it or the easier, the less you'll be like this is taking forever. Unless it's like certain manga, like Demon Slayer, I think takes like a super long time on its fights. But like that's even compared to like everything else. But anyway, that's not here or there. I. I thought this chapter was really good. It's like kind of an action chapter. It's like a executing the plan kind of chapter. But that's what I love about The Promised Neverland is that is that we are fighting with a plan. And it's so cool. I love there's like specific uh moments, but one of the things that I took notice of is the so one of the demons it appears was the original guard or guard, you know, the guy in charge of Gracefield when they escaped. Yeah, And yeah. so it was interesting that he was like, I'm not letting them escape again. I thought that was really cool. You know, it's an interesting tie-in to the very beginning of this manga. Yeah, that, they're, that he's still there coming back. I also like how, you know, you can really see the growth in the, the kids in that they're really following Emma's design of she doesn't want to harm anyone, human or demon. So, yeah, they're shooting at the demon, at the start when they bust out the room, but their goal isn't to kill the demons. Like, you figure that out, that their goal was just to confine them, and then you can assume that that gas is some sort of knockout agent, but they're not killing anyone. They're just getting control, which makes me very curious what they're going to do with Ratrigan. What the prom, like, 
what they're going to try to do with him, if the promise is going to come into play, like what's going to happen, because I don't think that they're going to kill him. The promise has got to come into play. I I don't even know. Like, I have no ideas as to what the promise is now. But, like, they're not going to kill Peter. Like, because, you know, it's Emma. Emma's never going to kill Peter. They're, they're going to take him down, and that might hurt. But they're not going to kill him. Uh, what I'm interested to see is what they do with Isabella. Mom. Because they do have, like, a connection to her that is, a, like... I mean, obviously deeper than they have with Peter Rotri. You know, he's just an enemy to them, but, like, she, like, did raise them. So I'm I'm interested to see what they'll do when they capture her. I think they will capture her, but I, I'm just interested. I have a mild theory that she will help them in some capacity when it seems like the tide is in their favor. Because we saw that before, and, I mean, to be fair, that was when she thought all hope was lost for herself. And so she wanted to give them the best chance. And if you guys remember, like, hid um, the ropes and stuff like that. So it wasn't as clear where and how they escaped. Um, and so she's definitely got a self-preservation instinct. You can see from how she's handling stuff. But also I think she does have some sort of genuine love for these kids. A bit twisted, a bit misshapen. But, I mean, what kind of love would I have if I lived in a society where it's either... Let the kids be killed or you get killed. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious if we'll see her uh, provide a helping hand again. Yeah, yeah, we might. But, I, I, you know, I thought it was interesting that they could hijack the Gracefield, like, communications network and, and figure stuff out. You know, it was a cool action chapter. But I, I don't really have a whole lot to say about this chapter, actually, other than, you know, it was cool. But do you have anything else? No, I think that about summed it up. It was cool action. I'm ready to see what happens next. Yep, yep. I'm ready to see. And we are, I mean, we're coming to a close with The Promised Neverland, which is unfortunate, but in a way unfortunate, but in a way also, you know, cool. It's had a good run. It has, it has. It has a very solid run. So I'm I'm excited to see to see what happens with, with The Promised Neverland going forward. But that's kind of all I got for this week. Yeah. Um, that moves us on to the next on the list, which is The Guardian of the Witch, with its third chapter. Um, this is so high on the table of contents for it for chapter three. I mean, chapter two is where, you know, usually a manga drops off a lot, but chapter three, you should be at the bottom of the barrel. Guardian of the Witch is killing it out here. That's because it's really good. It's... I've really enjoyed it, at least. I... I think it's cool, these, these types of characters, these perspectives, um, how they're developing already is really cool. I also, I love this introduction of a second guardian and another witch, and how that guardian's like a fanboy, while also ready to fight them, is really cool. Yeah, so, I kind of going through it, right? One of the things, so, Nada seems like she knows a lot about this world. And, like, she's, like, thought about how to stop which, you know, how to help Manasfa, you know? Which is cool and good for her character. I think that I will eventually end up liking Nada, but I just, or Nada, however you want to say her name, I'm not sure. I think I'll end up liking her, right? But I, like, I'm having a hard time. I like her already. She's enjoyable enough. She's just, she's more pragmatic and she thinks about things more, whereas Fafner clearly acted on a whim and now they're playing catch-up. And Fafner is the dopest thing ever. But that's neither here nor there. Um, so what do you think about this this retired witch? What, do you, what are your thoughts about this? Because I think it's a very interesting way to take the story. Yeah, I think it's an interesting concept. And with that, I basically I have the, the two questions that they have, these two propositions. Either they figured out a way to remove the, the evil there, or it's it has slowed considerably. And so... I, I'm asking the same questions the characters are asking. How is this possible when what we know of the world so far is eventually it mutates to the point that you're unrecognizable and need to be killed? I think if I had to pick one of their options. Now, my knowledge of manga tells me that, that it's a third option. But if I had to pick one of the two, I think I'm picking the one where it's just slowed down. 
and that her magic has something to do with that. That's my guess. And it's specific to her. But I could be totally wrong. It could be option one, and they removed it somehow. But we'll see. Time will tell. I really entertain the third option, that these are, like, arbitrarily created things by the the government. Like, some sort of, like, serum infection type thing. How that manifests into magic powers, I don't know. But I think it's a lot more simulated than we think. I never trust the government. Really? In these types of things. This is the church and the government. They're the same thing. Oh, that's even worse. Yeah, yeah. So when we're lacking that separa- separation of church and state, I go, mm, I don't trust the man with the convenient story about Fafner and the witch that killed his family or attacked his friends, whatever happened there. I yeah. forget exactly. So we're going to know here, right, to find the witch, right? And then we get introduced to the two that you were talking about. The uh, the Guardian and the Witch. So, Gen, the Guardian, right? He reminds me of several characters from manga. First of all, that pose there with the hands behind the head, that is a classic I am an anime or manga kid, and I'm really strong, but I'm acting playful because I'm a child. Um, he gives me some Naruto vibes. Oh, yeah. I, I feel that a little bit. I, I relate him the most with a character called Killua, from Hunter Hunter, but I don't think you've uh, read that or seen that. So no, not I don't think familiar. he he looks a lot. I think like Killua, his haircuts, his haircuts a little different, but he he's got that vibe he's giving me. Killua is like a child assassin, by the way, in his manga. So like, it it fits that he's really strong, and it seems like they are really strong. Although I will say, it seems like it's all the witch, right? Because. He just like held his hand out, and clearly it was her use of magic that did, because he doesn't. He's a guardian. He doesn't have magic. Yeah, but the, I think she creates his weaponry, that metal right. magic. So that synchronization and that power. So I think this is interesting too because it's presenting this guardian and witch as more of a team, which right. you don't see with Fafner and. I'm blanking on our witch's name. Manasfa. Manasfa. They're weird names. I don't blame you about that. <laughs> yeah. But but they're not a partnership. In fact, it's disdain, which, I mean, we learned the reason for that. Whereas this guardian and witch um, seem to have more of a partnership and camaraderie. Sort of like an older sister, little brother thing, especially with how she chastises him for speaking so rudely to everyone. So just an interesting change in dynamic. And I'm curious if that's the typical witch and guardian dynamic or not. I think, because we are told in chapter one that, like, Fafner just got assigned to be the guardian. So it was it was a new assignment for him. So, like, maybe given time. And we, I mean, we already see Fafner and Manasfa are connecting on a deeper level already. Oh, yeah. So I think sure. given time, they would have developed a relationship, like, that's a partnership. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's a lot of, you know, Manasfa's the fire witch. So there's a lot of very fire, very manga related abilities to be had there with a fire swordsman. I'm just saying it's happened before and it's been cool before and it will be cool again. But uh, let's let's talk about the fact that they are known. I mean, Gen names them. He knows Fafner and Manasfa by name, and he's, like, fanboying about them. Yeah, and that Fafner has a nickname of Ogre Blade. Yeah. Which is really cool. So it doesn't surprise me that he's well-known. I mean, he's depicted as a as a boy that rose up in the ranks very quickly. Yeah, he smacked a dude's hair off with a, with a kendo stick. But it's uh, Manasfa having... The being well known, it makes me curious about like the layout of their world, because they describe them as holding down the front lines. So is it just that they're um, that they're on the outskirts, on like the furthest edge, and so they keep the main area protected? Like they are truly the first line of defense. What or what or how is this city? How is the world laid out? First of all, and I should have mentioned this before. But this is just Britain. And we see a map of it when Nada's talking. And it's just the island of, of England. Um, I'll, but 
So, so the landmass is definitely just uh, Britain, but as, as far as like geography, but um, I think that it works like the city states are um, each of the like Bernie was the city state they were from, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just like a a walled city. And when they say the first line of defense, I think they're talking about a witch being the first line of defense for any city because they're so powerful. So I, I think that it wasn't like Bernie was special or anything. It was that that's how this world works. Because the evils are out there, they have to have witches to, and guardians to protect the city walls. Yeah, I'm so just curious, though, because when we see, like, the first layout of the city walls and then there's walls leading towards other villages, I'm curious if it is set up where there's sort of, like, a collection of cities yeah i think so and then a wilderness area which leaves these villages on the outskirts less protected i would imagine but yo that village looks very penetrable that that village looks looks terrifyingly weak and frail yeah so i'm really curious about this because it's clear that the the evils are out there right because they come I mean, see hiding but we see them kill one like outside of this village yeah so um curious what's happening there kind of wondering if villages have witches but i'm imagining not they seem like a city thing yeah and they just got really buff farmers perhaps uh, you know what i could use some buff farmers in my manga could use some buff farmers in a manga <laughs> you know i don't see them nearly enough yeah um so the last thing i want to talk about is do the disguises seem like not disguises to you it yeah. seems like it's just still them <laughs> Yeah, it's all pretty obvious. I mean, she does cover the mark on her face that would reveal her to be a witch. And I guess to be fair, uh, the the uh, not the assistant. What do you want to call her? Nada. Nada. She she should not really have a recognizable face. Well, she's on a wanted poster too. All three of them are. But how quickly were those able to spread out? I mean, we saw them at the end of chapter two. I don't know if they got to the villages, but... That's what I'm saying. Like, I, I think that there's still a possibility of keeping their heads down, so... Yeah, we'll see. I thought it was a cool chapter, though. I, I like the introductions and kind of the info about the world. It was interesting. Yeah, I'm, sorry to, I'm excited to see the secondary conflicts. It would have been cool just, like, world building and watching them go on this journey, but now that there's, like, an equal competitor... Because this is a guardian versus a guardian. So, and a witch versus a witch, which I think ups the level of what Fafner and Manaspa were versing before. So I think that would be up the excitement. I am so hyped to see Fafner and Manaspa fight together. I Because I don't think that witches will fight. It's I don't think it'll be like one-on-one -on -one separately. I think it's the witch is empowering the guardian. I think that's how these fights are going to go. And if that's true, I'm so hyped to see how Fafner fights. And they're probably going to goof it up because they're not, you know, they haven't ever fought together. You oh, know? They're going to have a learning curve because they're not in sync at all. But I'm excited to see what happens, you know, in the coming weeks. But yeah. it was really cool. Anything else about the Guardian of the Witch? No. I think I'm putting a the in, in the front of that title. It's not there. Guardian of the Witch. Anyway. Um, so that brings us to the next one, which is My Hero Academia, came out with chapter 261 this week. First thoughts on MHA. Eh. Yeah. Eh, correct. Eh. Again, a fight scene prolonged over multiple chapters makes me go, eh. We didn't really even get a whole lot of info this chapter either. Yeah, and I'm kind of bored with the Nomu. I just, so these ones are a little cooler. We're getting a little more elite and a little more specialized, but I'm like... I don't know, Nomu are starting to be as fascinating as just encountering a new villain. I'm like, ah, cool, someone to fight. It's not It's not like the impact of when All Might fought a Nomu way back when. Yeah, that was really cool. But, like, that was, we just found out the Nomu, and it was like, All Might was, like, so much stronger than everything else. And so, like, the fact that it could keep up with him was really cool. Yeah, now I feel like we're just overdoing it. I don't know, I like the science, like, taking quirks and making monsters, like... It's cool, and these Nomu are different. Oh yeah, that's because they're very advanced tech. I mean, this is a this is a different breed of, of Nomu, you know. They're speaking, which is way creepier than I imagined it being. Yeah, it is a little uh, a little uncomfortable. 
I also, I don't like how there's literally one hero there fighting. Like, where is everyone else? Did they just send one scout forward to find, like, the real doctor? I think they, like, split up, and I think she just found them. And if she thought it was just him, like, she could take him out. He is quirkless, like... I just use the buddy system, friends. Come on now. It is true. Should they do need to apply one one, get your a sidekick support. buddy system. Is she a sidekick or is she a main hero? I wasn't implying she was a sidekick. I was making a Sky High reference. No. Oh, well, that's good. But also, like, I think she might be a sidekick. I'm just literally not sure if she's a main hero or a sidekick. I mean, she's a bunny. With some good kicks. I she, I mean, she can mess a dude up. Like, I'm not trying to sleep on her here, but, like, she can mess somebody up. But, like, she seems like a sidekick character, right? I mean, she's not a flashy power. She's got some high-powered kicks. That's, you know, nothing, no cool flying or shooting fire ability, but. Also, am I supposed to care about the, uh, the armor guy? What, what do they call him? Uh, crust this guy i like am i supposed to care about him and like this is the first time we've seen him right it just feels really random for him to like pop up this chapter and just not matter well i mean it's just introducing another hero to help the battle so maybe he'll become important yeah i mean i'm sure there's time but i all he says but i'm not sure about your rank but i know your crust and so i'm kind of curious is he a good hero or is he a villainous hero because what does he mean by rank is it just superhero rank or is it rank within this paranormal army i think it's superhero i think what the nomu is saying is superhero rank but i think you may be onto something and that he might not be he might be with the paranormal liberation front instead of the heroes but i don't know all in all this chapter was meh you know yeah i thought it wasn't villain super much no that's all I have for this one. Do you have anything else? No, that sums it up. Also, My Hero Academia is going to be on break next week, so we won't even get another chapter next week, which is disappointing. Uh, I know that you're a big MHA fan, so it's disappointing. I am a big fan, and I feel like we just had a break, but whatever. I'm ready to go. Did we just have a break? I feel like maybe I think of One Piece. One Piece, just one Piece was just on a break, but yeah, My Hero Academia is the only manga that's on a break next week. All right, all right. But that brings us to the next one. Undead Unluck came out with Chapter 5. First thoughts. I really want to like it. And I just... I can't do it. I think I've biased myself too much that I can't do it. It's... I'm not... I'm not really loving it either. I gotta be honest. It's not like it's that bad. And I kind of almost enjoyed Unluck's little journey through life this week. You know, like... Learning to, like, paint and, like, kind of get along with people. Like, it was kind of cool, I thought. You know, it was nice. It was heartwarming, for sure. And the less undead there is, the less Andy there is, the less blurred box there is, which we all know what that... Why were his pants ripped down the middle just at the beginning of this chapter? Like, he was wearing pants, but, like, the box was there. Well, Well, the plane had... Um, it's like from the get-go it's just the plane blew up and only his crotch caught on fire probably who knows with that man i just think that the artist likes drawing that box in i mean but, it is kind of a humorous way to censor things but but it is interesting in fact i don't even really notice at this point i just accept that's what the character looks like now. <laughs> it's just he's, um, not, he's always naked i'm like having a hard time pinpointing how old unluck is supposed to be because she's described herself as being, like, a shut-in. So, like, we knew that she was good at painting and stuff like that. Like, that was implied before she started that she could do that. But she talked about how she'd been closed off for, like, the last ten years or so. So is that that she's only had those powers for that long? Or is it just, like, you know, that's when the catastrophe happened with her family? And so she's decided to, you know, never be around people again. And then she said that she's not in high school. So, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like she's young. And sometimes I feel like she's older. And that really determines how creeped out I am by undead. You know what I mean? I think that she should be old enough to be in high school. But I think that that she's not. As in, she has not attended school because of her unluck. 
I think that's what's going on here. Yeah. So I'm curious how that'll play out. Also, I kind of like this bad guy, this girl who, whatever her negator ability is, she oh. just, I don't know if it's a gravity thing. It's a, because she, she walks on water and then she makes water flow. I don't know. But I like how she's just super friendly and nice and like spends a whole day getting to know, you know, her little, uh, little lucky as she calls her. And then just when things get dramatic, Undead comes up with his crimson slice again. Yeah, I, I like Undead. You know, I like the fighting. I think Undead's really cool, but I think... So, going on the negator ability, what her ability is, I'm almost positive it's gravity. I would bet a lot on that. And the reason I say that is because the first time we see her, she's in space. Laughing, like laughing about like, haha, I'll see you in a minute undead like oh, i didn't realize that's where she was and so i think it's gravity because i think i think she's in space i mean it could be something else but i definitely i think gravity is a good guess and the way that the bubble is shaped of the water it does look cool i gotta say he is a good artist or she i actually don't know if the author of this manga is a man or a female but i it's a good artist you know there's a little fish in the pond. It's, you know, there's detail here. Yeah, it's good stuff. But um, the fact that she is, like, at least 50 years old is a little alarming. And that makes me think that it's not gravity that she's negating. Because, like, that should not be possible. Because it's clear that he negates death, and that's why he's alive. But, like, why is she alive? Maybe there's something inherent to, like, the negator where... So in his case, he literally can't die, but in but her but like being a negator, maybe you just don't age, in the sense that like you can like she would die if you shot her, but sure. she's not going to die of natural causes, you know, of okay. getting too old. Yeah, but maybe. then how do we do the water thing, like? No, I mean that she's got like the her negator ability would be like to negate gravity, but I'm saying like as part of being oh, a negator, your oh. your body system is just you don't age. Because he doesn't die, but he also ha doesn't age. Like and I don't know how that relates relates yeah, together true. if that's just like that he regenerates back to his form. Or maybe you hmm. could argue that they do age because it's not like he popped out the chute being this buff man. So, Maybe he did, and that's more alarming. <laughs> I've got questions. <laughs> no, I feel like they age. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I, You know, it was an interesting chapter, I think. I just, you have anything else to add on Undead Unlock this week? Uh, no, I think that covered it. All right. So next, then, is Mission Yozakura Family, which had chapter 24 just come out. Um, So what'd you think? What'd you think? You Last week... When we talked about it, you were we were both big into Mission Yozakura family. What did you think about this week? I thought it was really good. I liked where we're coming forward um, in the development here and how, you know, he appeals to Tayo, the, um, I can't think of the villain's name for this arc. Your, Kuro your own... Gao. Kuro Gao. Kuro Gao. Oh. Gao. Yeah, Kuro Gao. So, like, how... His know, fake name's Kuro Yuri. That's what I was thinking of. So how, you know, he's looking at Tayo as like a kindred spirit, someone who understands loss and understands that pain and making them suffer and, you know, wanting to take it easy on Tayo for that. Um, However, I like how Tayo's pretty like single-minded that he doesn't need to know the full details about his family. Which makes me really curious as a reader about his family. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm like, what's, what's going on with his family? I would like to know. Does the exact opposite to me. Thank you, Tayo. But, but Tayo's just like, I don't want another life to be lost. And he stays true to the mission. Um, that was cool. That was, yeah. really, that was really dope. That was really cool. <laughs> that was cool he gets back up. I, I am terrible with remembering characters' names. But um, the, the person who shows up and is like, you take care of him, I'll take care of this. I was like, that's so cool. Like, I think his name was Sui. He's part of the Hinagiku, like the government spies. 
Okay. I but I think that 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 goes into because uh, they say something about like you shouldn't do this alone. Um. I don't know. He says something about like you you can't fight me alone or something, and then that's when he shows up. Um, and so I think that I think that it's important that he has that Tayo has allies. I was kind of surprised that one of the family members didn't show up though. I I don't like that we're transitioning to the Hinagiku being like his backup instead of the Yozakura family. I'm curious, like, if it's not, that we're not, like, really doing that transition, but it's, like, sort of a family test, and I can also picture, again, terrible names, the older brother saying, no, 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 we're not going to go help him yet, because we all know he wants Tyler to die. He won't kill him, he just wants him to die. It's my favorite character in this whole, well, okay, Kuro Gao's pretty dope, but other than Kuro Gao, Kyoichiro, which is the oldest brother, he's my favorite character in this whole manga. He's... He's really creepy. creepy. He's so creepy, but he's so cool. I really love him. It. I really love. I mean, Tayo. Almost everything Tayo does, I think, is so cool. Yeah, it's a very cool manga. But I, what do you think about the backstory? What do you think about Kuro Gao's Kuro Gao's uh, origin story as a supervillain? How how you feeling? That was upsetting, but. I get it. I mean, it's that traditional spy life. You think he would have, as a spy, like, he would have covered his tracks a little more so that, you know, his daughter wasn't traceable in that sense for them to do that. Well, I don't think it was about his daughter. I think it was about him. They wanted to kill him. Well, yeah, but I'm saying if he had covered his tracks more carefully and, like, lived in greater secrecy, they wouldn't have known where to send that. Do you think his wife died because of this thing? Because it says his wife died. Like, she says her mom died, and I'm like, oh, what if... I don't know, it doesn't say that, so I shouldn't speculate that far, but... I'm just saying, this man could have a very sad life. I don't know, that might be related, but I get the impression that the wife is not... is not directly related there, because he doesn't go on any sort of bitter spree after that. It's just... I think it is such a cool statement, where it's almost like he understands, like, them wanting to be rid of him, and he can sympathize to that point... But he's also like, I needed them to understand what it meant to have me as an enemy. And I'm like, that is a really cool villain line. Oh my word, it's so cool! Everything he does is so awesome. I just love Kurogao so much. He's it, my favorite villain for this manga. I also love that he resurfaces in the outfit that he was wearing when he met his daughter for a birthday. Oh, it's so sweet. And that's sweet. its own, like, cathartic, oh, it hurts so sad bad. feels there. But that's really all like I have on that. It's a good yeah. chapter. I'm excited to see what comes next. Yeah, the only other thing I would add is I'm so excited to see red, blue, and yellow. The three guys did not desert him. They came back. They're always back. The guys with the little face masks. I'm very excited to see them fight Sui. I hope that we see that fight. Um, But either way, I'm very excited for more of Kurogao going forward. Yeah, I feel like he won't be here too much longer, though, unless he, like, escapes and then becomes an antagonist. But I feel like he'll have to be wrapping up soon. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, But anything else about Mission Yuzakura family? No. Then we move on to Mashley, Magic, and Muscles. Uh, They came out with Chapter 4 this week. So, uh, first thoughts on Mashley. This show is ridiculous, and I love it. (laughs) It's so funny. It's It's pretty good, right? I, I love it. I, you know, we've talked about this where I, I love that how it's, it's clearly a gag manga in the sense that it's very funny, but also Mashley is just so serious about how he does everything. Like, he's not trying to be funny, and that's the part that really gets me. It's a, it's like a show done in seriousness, but it's also super funny because it's just a ridiculous proposition. I mean, the man threw the broom and then launched himself on top of it to look like he was flying. And I'm like, <laughs> precisely how far can this go? Can brute force just make this happen? Also, the way that they draw pictures of, like, the illustrator here is just killing it with the faces that they make when they're surprised by what <laughs> Mashley has done. Or what Mash has done. I just love it when they're shocked. When he's, you know, on the end panel, he's baking cookies. And he's like, oh, I like to bake alone. <laughs> oh, and the, the bully is fuming outside. Oh, it's the best. I just, whoever draws these expressions, 
I just love it. When they throw the broom, the one boy's face, and the way it says what, like W-U-T, it's just, it's comedic gold. It's not like a wow manga, but it's one that, like, never fails to make me laugh. So I'm going to always enjoy it, I think. Yeah, so going along with the Harry Potter metaphor that's clearly here, we have now met uh, McGonagall, just this chapter, as the only other teacher, I guess. Um, we can add her to Dumbledore and Snape that we met before. Um, I don't know if I really want to call Lucci Snape. I don't know that he deserves that title, but... Nah, that doesn't fit. But the headmaster is definitely a Dumbledore knockoff, let's be clear. And like, I feel like this is McGonagall, right? It looks like her, yes. And then, so, uh, I feel like we've, we've even had, like, a little confrontation about the broom. I mean, does this not feel a little reminiscent of the Harry and, um, Draco thing in the very beginning? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I mean, it's funny. It's obviously just comedic. It's not... I will say it went much better for Harry. Natural born Quidditch skills. Mash it went better? I mean, this man also won. Yeah, but Mash has got more like Neville Longbottom vibes. Just like really buff. Is... You know what I mean? I'm sorry. <laughs> you're going to go ahead and say that Neville Longbottom in the beginning. You're going to go... That man, that's a buff dude. That's a buff child. No, 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 no. I'm not saying Neville's buff. I'm saying if Neville were buff, he would be mash. That would be mash. No, that's not fair, actually. I shouldn't hate on Neville like that. Wow. Okay. Um, but that's probably enough about Harry Potter. Um, oh, but everyone who is listening to this podcast, please take a moment. Go look at the manga and find the panel after he throws the broom. The teacher's face when she says world record, a world record has been set, is so funny. Just, I love <laughs> the art in this manga. That's really funny that you like this art so much. But, so, um, yeah, the bully is real messed up. He, uh, he sewed the kid's mouth shut. I'm not down with that. Looks gross. I hate it. I, I don't like that. I don't like how magic is applied here. This is a bad... I, I like that he looks like... Um, I'm trying to think of a character that we've both seen that this matches. But, like, I'm thinking, like, for, for the listeners of the podcast, I'm thinking, like, Gini Chimaro from Bleach. He's got that, like, snaky feel. Oh, you know? For the, for the Harry Potter fans at home, he's just Draco Malfoy. Really? You think? Mm -hmm. Blonde hair, father with connections. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. A bully probably gonna start an intense rivalry because he got stood up by mash <laughs> yeah. what i love about that last panel is mash's comment this is pretty fun making cream puffs on my own and then he goes i think i forgot i feel like i'm forgetting something oh well and the bully like the bully's like losing his mind i like how it just writes doom around his face it's it's it's, it's really perfect. funny but it, it was a funny chapter. It was definitely funny. I like the roommate stuff, too, where the kid's like, please don't have that be my roommate. And of course, it is, and MASH has already lifted the door off the hinges. Hey, where's the door to my room? Oh, you're holding it. That's nice. And like, the kid's just trying to be, like, nice but distant, and MASH is, like, being MASH. It's interesting. I, I think it's funny. But, yeah. I mean, that's really all I have to say about it, though. Anything else? No, that's it. Cool. So, Mitama Security, Spirit Busters, uh, Chapter 24, released this week. Um, and this is the most recent manga that you've caught up on, right? Um, yeah. Yes, it is. So, what did you, you think about this? What did you think about the return of my favorite character in this entire show? Well, he could not be any more ridiculous. Oh! Oh! <laughs> the fish puns abound. It's too much. It's it's too much. He makes fish puns. I do love how love he walks up to like every ghost he sees. And he goes, <laughs> "Hey, have you um considered joining a salmon enterprise?" It's an empire. Like he's <laughs> just like he's like, "What do you think about me having an empire?" And I like how he's talking to what's his name, Nobiru. Zobiro. Zobiro. Right, the foot guy, the foot yeah. one. Yeah. I'm sorry, I keep thinking of someone else's name. But the feet, and he asked the question we've all been wondering, is your face growing feet? Like, is your, are your feet growing out of your face, or is your face growing out of your feet? And you know what? I want answers, too. But he's at this fish place, and then he he's goes a... for the bait, and he turns into a real salmon that's, like, 
suddenly visible by all the humans there. It's too much. It's it's too much. I love so his name, right? That he that he wants to be called by is uh Shake Jiro, which Shake is just salmon, right? But Jiro means little brother. Why who's the big brother? He just calls himself that. It's how he it's, it completes his family image. But he wants to be an emperor of the Salmon Empire. Yeah, that's why I think that's all part of the ploy. I mean, that's what he says. I love how he comes in all friendly, like, yeah, I'm just here to hang out, like, with, like, the two, like, little kid um, spirits or whatever. And then it, like, immediately, like, cuts to, like, his evil monologue. Which is, like, <laughs> right. <laughs> not even that evil. He's just like, oh, yes, I've got them. Now I'm going to have my salmon empire. He said, he said, and I quote, that he is a pacifist. <laughs> and he he lied to us about that. You can't lie with your puns. What what nonsense. A pacifist. All of the times it says cod instead of could. I just... There was one time, there was one time that really made me laugh. I don't know. I forget what it is. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, there's one, I, so Yuko's reaction to him is hilarious. She's like, I can't do live fish. <laughs> she just rejects him on the premise of what he is. <laughs> she's like, I can't, like, she's clearly like grossed out just like looking at him. And he like, I love that he walks away crying and he's like, salmon <laughs> fish never cry because the rivers and the sea wash them away. <laughs> it's really funny. I also love Commentary Ghost. I wish that there was more of him. I like how he's giving his commentary in the background. I hate that they, you know, supplant it with a little bit of yada, 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 but... <laughs> you, oh. you want all of the commentary spirit? I <laughs> Mr. Commentary? I'm going to say one of my favorite chapters was when Mr. Commentary spent the whole chapter just narrating his day with the girl. I loved it. I that loved it funny. so much. This is the salmon. And then when he becomes like a real salmon, he like wants people to eat him. I don't understand. <laughs> that was so disturbing. <laughs> so this really bears the question, like what sort of trauma happened in his life? Because if we're thinking about this through, thinking this through, is this just that he was a salmon who died and his spirit stayed around to haunt people? And he just sort of manifested it some legs to build his salmon empire. And overalls. And over. Do not forget the overalls. He looks like a very down-to-earth salmon, but he is not. He is an empirical mastermind who gets bear smacked into a wall so hard that it leaves an imprint. <laughs> it's really, it's really funny. It's a really funny chapter. Why is that a technique? Why does Mitama have that as a technique? Okay, I, I've stopped questioning Matama's techniques. I mean, he's a man powered by his tears. What? That's true. That's true. The great Lord Salmon won't back down so easily. Oh, it's so the good. The story of the Salmon Empire has only just begun. I cannot take a fish in overall seriously. Come on. I can. I can. And I, I would like to say, I would like to be the first to go on record to say, I'm down with the Salmon Empire. I think, let's go. You would you would join the Salmon Empire? I would absolutely join the Salmon All Empire. Right. If it's led by this guy, absolutely. Shakijiro, favorite character in all of Mitama Security. Also, I love that he goes, it's implied that, like, he shares an apartment with Jenka. Because Jenka's like, haven't seen you all day. Like, welcome home. <laughs> like, it's just implied that they share an apartment now. Yeah. It's really funny. Also, the line between what's a spirit and what's a human is just so blurry now. Like, Yeah, we've really got it all mixed up. There's like no really different, but it was really. I thought it was a really funny chapter. I thought it was it was good. Yeah, I mean, it was good. I, it kind of felt like a waste, but it was funny. Yeah, but so anything else on Mitama? No. So that leads us to Zip Man chapter ten. Uh, what do you think? What, what are your first thoughts about Zip Man? This chapter ten. I don't like it. No. I. It just doesn't feel good. I don't. I don't really find it particularly funny. I don't I'm not really vibing with the action sequences. It's just all around not my fave. Yeah. Uh yeah, I can agree with that. I mean the fight was okay, you know? But it's it was like so it's like classic shonen cool, right? 
Also, we're getting way closer to mech stuff than I thought we would get. Like, with the, um... I still think that it's cool that they're suits, you know? But it does feel like, especially with, like, the power-up that we got for, um... For the main character, like... And the, the brother not being there in the suit anymore. Like, I don't know, the fight was cool. But at the same time, I was like, okay. You know, it's a cool shonen fight. The villain was okay. But it just felt okay, you know? Gurren Logan did it better, you know? Gurren Log- This is not a mecha show. I don't... It- Gurren Logan was not a manga ever. I- but also, of course Gurren Logan did it better. <laughs> Gurren Logan is the best. I'm just saying. I don't know. I just don't... I'm not feeling it. Yeah, but I... I, I don't know. I enjoyed it. I, just, I read it to talk about it, but like... I'm not going to be mad if it's canceled. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I, I understand that. It's So, I guess the most interesting part to me is that one, Mashiro, I think that's his name, the older brother, right? Or the other brother. Maybe it's a younger brother. I don't know. The brother that was not in a body, right? Yeah. He He really didn't come back. And we see that panel of um, Nanami... Is his name Nanami? It might not be Nanami. The main uh, character. It's upset. I should know the main character's name. That just kind of goes to show where I feel this manga is in my loves. Yeah. But we see him like that cool panel where like it looks like half his face is crying. And I'm like, you know, that's interesting. But I think it was interesting that they didn't just immediately bring him back. I think that's actually a good sign for this manga going forward. You know, that, that maybe the writing will get a little different. And I liked the 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 note and the finishing off of the the clearly incompetent main villain of this arc. I thought he was super incompetent. Yeah, he really didn't do well. That's that's that was the other reason. This was it. Like nothing was really compelling here. Nothing felt like a hard win. Right. It felt like he just kind of ran up the tower, you know. And he did the thing, and he saved China, and here we are. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't really have a whole lot to say about it, you know, because of that. But you have anything else? No, I think that covered it. That brings us to our last one that we both read, um, which is a Gravity Boys that just came out with chapter nine. Um, so, what did you think about a Gravity Boys this week? I, I don't know. It was funny. It wasn't particularly wowsome. Yeah, I didn't. It was kind of like. Especially for A Gravity Voice, which is another one of those that I actually do really like. You know, I have found it really funny in the past. Like, the the episode where Geralt has to go to the bathroom the whole episode. Or, the episode. The chapter where Geralt has to go to the bathroom. That was funny. Yeah, no, that was really funny. I This one was just... You know, he's, like, stiff from the, the steroids he's taken. I do I did like the higher beings commentary. I love the it. higher being like, every time. He literally just comes in to mess with them. But, like, it was, like, kind of cool to see, um, oh, who was it that went to the volcano? Um, Saga. Saga. I don't know why. I, could, I mix up him and Baba just because their names are similar, even though they don't look similar. And it was, like, that, like, bonding with the... Uh, with the uh, the bros, the little the jumbros, jumbros, like that bonding, it felt reminiscent to me of whenever you know if anyone's a Guardians of the Galaxy fan, when they send Groot to get the 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 controller for, for <laughs> oh yeah Yondu's head, and he just <laughs> keeps coming back with literally anything else, <laughs> and these jumbros are just like rock after rock after rock, and he's like you know what. I'm going to keep defending you. You're going to get it done. And I'm like, look at that bond. For look. friendship, you know? For friendship. And also, but what you learn is he was there for literally 24 hours. Because he gets <laughs> back with 10 minutes to spare. Well, he wasn't so, there for 24. Because well, he didn't get there till like the 15th hour. Okay, so. but so He's so, there for at least 15. <laughs> so for the majority of the, at least like half of that time, he's there. And then it, the episode ends with him also getting sick from the toxic fumes. And the higher <laughs> being just, like, comes in and goes, so, uh, there's something in the valley. 
Also, everything happening to Geralt while he's sick. <laughs> it's just, he, he like, he's... has this out-of-body experience. There's two of... What what kind of drug is this? And why does it have this impact? What what nonsense. Yeah. No, it's it's super ridiculous. It's I also like how the cure is instantaneous. And he sits up in this lovely pose. A very Geralt pose. Geralt pose. I... It's very... I'm back, and I'm just like, Gerald, calm down. He's back, and he's fabulous. <laughs> That's true. I it's it's it was interesting. It was you know it's it's kind of fun, but it wasn't as fun I think as some of the other chapters. I love the higher being. I actually thought that that Geralt was going to be fine the whole time, and that the higher being was just messing with them. But it actually turned out to be true, and I love how they say that um, Baba was the next to get sick. After, like, Saga, they cured Saga, and then Baba went to sa- get the thing to save him, and then he got sick. Yes. I mean, I still think that is part of the higher being messing with them, because I feel like there's ways to prevent getting sick, and he's just not... Oh, yeah. He's not sharing that information. Yeah. Oh, the higher being, you know. I just, I love any time the higher being is involved, because I love... I think he's so funny that he messes with him. He's really an enjoyable <laughs> character. Yeah. It was, it was interesting, though, but... Anything else on A Gravity Boys? I think that about covers it. All right. Well, um, we're going to take a little bit of a break, um, and then I'm going to come back with the manga that I read every week um, before we you know, wrap up into some of the commentary that we got coming after that. Okay, so now that uh, Irrelevant is taking a break from the podcast here, we'll talk about the the series that I read um, and that Irrelevant hasn't read yet. Now, she is trying to catch up on a lot of these series, and I think that she'll really enjoy many of the ones that, that um, she doesn't yet read. But for now, every week during the podcast, this is going to be the section where I just kind of talk about, you know, give a brief kind of explanation, I guess. I, you know, I just talk about the ones that I read, um, and Irrelevant doesn't. So, the first one that's in that category is Act Age, which came out with chapter 101 this week. Act Age was the cover page. Um, it had the cover this week, at least according to the, the Viz site, so that's a huge deal. Act Age, to be that popular, it's really cool. Now, this arc in Act Age is my favorite arc so far, so I totally understand why it would be more popular right now. But at the same time, it was really cool to see um, everything that's going on in, in Act Age right now. First of all, the the big color spread where they're all sitting in chairs, I loved seeing that. I loved all the colors and, I you know, the, their suits are, are slightly different colors, each of them behind them are different people sitting there who are who are backing them up. I really like this color spread. I thought it was a really cool cool uh c- you know, cool picture. So with that said, this chapter was kind of slowish compared to the the other chapters so far. So we see um Yonagi is going and confronting Hanako. She's She's talking with her, and, and you see that she even thinks it's awkward. But I'm glad that we got a little bit of closure. I'm I'm honestly surprised that we didn't get more. I guess we're just supposed to assume that Hanako and Yonagi's father were sleeping together. They were having an affair. That's why Yonagi's father was never around. But it seems weird that we haven't, like, vocally declared that, right? I... You know, maybe I'm crazy. You can tell me in the comments if you if you think that that you know you liked how this is. I actually liked it though. I liked that that Yonagi is just she has understood what the problem is in in uh, Hanako's life, and she wants to rectify that problem. I I think that's a very Yonagi thing to do, and that's why she's one of my favorite main characters going on in Weekly Shonen Jump right now. It's it's because she she has this heart for people that is that is amazing in my opinion. And so I love I love seeing this confrontation and everything else. Also, she isn't sure if she can do the other nights of the play, specifically because she doesn't have the same motivation as she had. She doesn't have that same feeling and it won't happen again. Um, and so Hanako's trying to trying to figure out what she needs to do here, and that's when uh, Kuroyami Kuroyami is that his name? I think it's his name. The main director guy, 
that's when Kuroyami um, comes up and is like, you've got to finish, if you can't finish what you started, then don't mess with my actor. He's he kind of saying like, listen, you got to get her back into shape. You're the director. It's your job. I like that part. You know, I liked, I liked seeing that. I also liked seeing how hard he's working, um, with, with his, his group to really get this in order. Um, also, you know, we see Chiyoko in her princess iron fan get up and it's it's going to be good. I honestly I didn't think that we were going to get to see team play or team B's play, but I'm really excited that we are probably going to see it. And so I'm excited to see Chiyoko play Princess Iron Fan. I'm excited to see Araya in a role that is more boisterous. I I would love to see him him play that. So I'm very excited about what's going on here in Act Age. Um and so excited for next week's chapter. But that's all I had on, on Act Age, so we'll move on to Demon Slayer. So Demon Slayer came out with Chapter 192 this week, and we are wrapping up for Demon Slayer. So one of the things that I found out, kind of an interesting lore point this week we saw was, so animals can apparently be demons too, because we're told that the cat that is uh, Tamayo's cat, you know, that cat was turned into a demon. And so... That that tells us that that animals, at least cats, could be can be turned into demons. So that that was an interesting kind of lore point. But overall, this chapter was really cool. I you know it was another fighting chapter. This is the final fight of the series, I think for sure. And so it was cool to see everything going down. Tanjiro still going at Muzan with all he's got, and it was even. I think even more cool to see Igoro. Igoro is slowly becoming one of my favorite characters in this series. He already I I like the snake guy in most manga anyway. And so he's already got the snake thing going for him, but now that he's he's blind and using the snake to to sense his surroundings, I I think is really cool. I think it's a really cool you know, a premise for a character, and so I'm very excited, and I like how frustrated Muzan is by it too, that, that a snake, a mere snake is reading his attacks, so, you know, it was very interesting, I thought this chapter was really good, and of course, at the end, we get to see the scars on Muzan's body, showing where Yorichi cut him, and so now Tanjiro has targets where he can cut Muzan and really, really hone in on him. I actually think that Muzan is going to die right as the sunrise happens. So I don't think the sunrise is going to kill him. I think that Muzan will be killed by Tanjiro. I think once Tanjiro masters this flow, that's when it'll happen. That That's my guess, at least. But um, please leave in the comments section what you, what you guys think. Um, whether whether you think that uh, they're gonna be able to, he, he's gonna be able to kill Muzan, or we're gonna have to wait for the sun. Either way, this manga is ra ramping down, but I'm very excited to see what the end of this manga has in store. But that's all I gotta say about Demon Slayer this week. So we will move on to the next most popular, which is Chainsaw Man. Chainsaw Man came out with chapter 58. I was actually surprised to see it this high up on the on the list. It's not you know, super high up, but it is in sixth place, which is pretty high, you know, considering there are 19 or I think over 19, maybe I think there might just be 19, 19 or 20 different series running right now in weekly jump to get six is, is pretty good. So chapter 58 came out. There's not a whole lot to talk about this chapter. I, I am becoming a little less a fan of Chainsaw Man as the, as the manga goes on. Now, I think that's because I'm not one for, for very gory manga. So I I usually shy away from the more the more gory and kinda like gross, I guess I'd say, manga. And Chainsaw Man's definitely one of those, especially the stuff that we're getting with who I'm gonna call Quan G. Um I don't know if that's how you're supposed to say her name, but she the stuff that we're getting with her, I definitely and her fiends that she has is is gross especially the one fiend with the, like the brain hanging out of her head I, it's gross it's really gross i mean when we first saw them they were all you know in a very uncomfortable position so definitely i think that this is not my favorite team of hunters i did think it was interesting the halloween thing the one the brain fiend saying like halloween and then 
just kind of everybody else kind of is brainwashed. That was interesting. I, you know, getting to know them a little bit was interesting, but I, they're still not my favorite team. Uh, my favorite team of hunters or of like, yeah, the people hunting Denji are still the, the ones that we saw in the beginning hunting that fox and cooking him. I think they're the coolest and I have high hopes for them, but we get to see the brother again who goes to stay with one of the friends of Kurose. And so it's really interesting, their conversation and specifically the part where we talk about um, what his, like Kurose's big brother, not wanting to continue, but the, 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 one, the youngest brother says, we, we get to know why they said that we're immortal, the, the three brothers. Um, and it's because they're ruthless, soulless, and emotionless, and they can carry out anything. A pro always gets the job done. So he kind of self, he kind of controlled himself and willed himself back into the fight. So the, the brother team is not out yet. They are down to one brother, but they're not out of the count yet. And Santa Claus is back and he seems to be able to turn people into puppets by touching, by having them touch shoulders. Um, and so that's going to be interesting. Obviously, we got some puppet stuff going on with him. Uh, he's super creepy. Definitely also not one of my favorites. But we'll see what goes on here coming. It was it was interesting to see some powers of, of some of these, these teams that are hunting down Denji. But overall, you know, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't the coolest chapter to me. But... Again, Chainsaw Man's not one of my favorites, so that's that's okay. But that's really all I got to say about Chainsaw Man, so we'll move on to Jujutsu Kaisen, which came out with Chapter 95 this week. Jujutsu Kaisen, actually all three of the past three that I've, I've talked about, Demon Slayer, Chainsaw Man, and Jujutsu Kaisen, are those manga that I, I call like Monster Hunter manga. Like, the goal of the manga is to hunt a specific monster you know, in Demon Slayer, it's Muzan, in uh, Chainsaw Man, it's the Gun Devil, right? Yeah, it's the Gun Devil. In Jujutsu Kaisen, it's it's uh, the, the cursed spirits that are, I, you know, all around. So, but despite the fact that it's similar, all three of them are very distinct from each other in art style and in like the level of intenseness. And I think that Jujutsu Kaisen is right in the middle. I love the stuff that we got with Ino and Nanami. Nanami is one of my favorite characters in Jujutsu Kaisen. And Ino is becoming one of my favorite characters. I really hope he doesn't die here because I really, really like him. I think it's cool that he's the, uh, the protege, the pupil of Nanami and that he's, he's willing to stick by his side. I think how he fights is cool. I love that he has the four beasts as, as his cursed spirit helpers. That's awesome. Um, if you don't know the four beasts that, that we see him have, and they talk about are those, those four beasts are like in, I, I believe in Chinese myth, it's like they, they hold up the four corners or the four winds. It's the dragon, the turtle. Um, what are the other ones? There's like a bird of some kind and I think a bull. But they like hold up the four corners of the world. But anyway, I like his powers. I think he's really cool. And I hope that this fight that we're getting to see with this the, the grandmother and the younger guy, I, I really hope that that... that is, is really cool. I think it will be. But most of the fight we got to see Den or er, Denji, <laughs> that's from Chainsaw Man, Itadori and Fushiguro just just pummel the mustache guy. I really like how the mustache guy looks and he reminds me of um he looks a lot like Netero, Isaac Netero from Hunter x Hunter. And so I you know he's kind of dressed like him too. I really think he's cool. I like his look and he's he's getting pummeled and they they do not he he just is not being hurt he also cuts itadori which i'm sure will come into play next chapter um but i really liked seeing the fight that that they were having and obviously we ended off with some weird powers that the grandma has which she says toji zenin i don't know what that means but starts to, it looks like, transform the younger guy into someone else. I, I'm i not sure who the younger guy is transforming into, so if you do know, please uh, leave that in the comments. I'd love to I'd love to know, but it looks like a cool power. I'm interested to see how it affects the fight with Eno going forward. So, 
that's pretty much all I had for Jujutsu Kaisen. It was a very cool chapter. It was a very cool fighting chapter. I liked it. And I'm looking forward to next week. I'm looking forward to some conclusions to some of these fights. But that's all I got for Jujutsu Kaisen. So we'll move on to Dr. Stone, which is just put out chapter 139. Um, Dr. Stone traditionally is not one of my favorite manga running in Shonen Jump, but it is a really cool manga, and I'd hate to downplay it, you know? So, with that being said, 139 was really good. I like, first of all, the, the revelation we got last chapter, that it's Senku's voice um, say giving the command to pretty much uh, petrify the entire world with the petrification device, or the Medusa, I think they call it now, but it's... It's Senku's voice, but this chapter they find out it's an artificial voice, and they're trying to find it. Um, some things that were, were interesting. Uh, the girls back in fighting shape was cool. As well as the samurai that we unlocked. I'm trying to look for his name. Huh. I can't find it. But it's it's very interesting. He, he's a very interesting guy. I, I like, first of all, I like Samurai. Second of all, he looks like Sasaki Kojiro um, from Vagabond and and from, like, real life. Well, Sasaki Kojiro is, like, not real, but sort of real. But anyway, he looks like a cool Samurai. I'm very excited that he's joining the team. I, I look forward to, to see what, what's going to happen with him in the future. Also... We are now, the next mission is to go to the moon, because that's where this synthetic voice is coming from. Now, if you remember, uh, maybe a month or two back, there was a spin-off, a Dr. Stone spin-off series called um, Dr. Stone Reboot Byakia, I believe. And it was about Senku's uh, dad, Byakia Ishigami, and the space team that came back to Earth. But at the end, it was about the robot named Ray who created a body for, I guess, herself um, and kept maintaining the space station. I think that is now going to come in play. I always thought when it was being serialized that it was going to matter for the main storyline. That's why I read it, despite not being super interested in it. I thought it was going to matter for the main Dr. Stone storyline. So I, I read that spinoff in its entirety and then came here to, to what's going on. In Dr. Stone, I think we're going to meet up with that satellite and Ray. I, I, I think it's going to be a cool reunion and Senku will return. I am very excited to see how on earth in the stone world they build a spaceship. But it is Senku, so I'm not putting anything past him. It's very possible. Um, and I'm kind of excited to learn how, how one would do this with the primitive tools that they have. But I'm very interested to see what happens going forward. But that's kind of all I got on Dr. Stone this week. It was an interesting chapter and it was a pretty good chapter. But... With that being said, the last chapter that, that I have to go over here is Samurai 8, The Tale of Hachimaru, came out with chapter 38 this week. So, normally this kind of chapter would not be something that I super enjoy. However, I think that this was an amazing Samurai 8 chapter. Uh, this, this chapter focused entirely on the emotions of Hachimaru and Anne. And I think that that was very well needed. I love how they both talk to the princess and samurai that are that are there on the ship. And, and to try and figure out how to mend a relationship that is a human relationship. Not a, a, just a samurai and his princess, but two people. And I love how the topic was, you need to see the other as a human being. As someone you have to relate to or can relate to and you should be relating to. I think that that was a great moral, a great lesson. I'm very excited to see what happens in the future. But principally, I think that this was an amazing chapter for Hachimaru and Anne. To get closer to one another and to grow as as both a couple and as a pairing of a samurai and his princess of fate. Also... I'm going to lay out my prediction that I think Goku is bad. I don't think Hanaichi, the, the dog-looking master of Goku, is bad. But I think that Goku is going to be with Ada in some way. Ada's going to come and attack them, and Goku is going to join him. That's my guess. Goku just seems like too nice of a guy to not be be evil. I And I think that while Hachimaru was like having a grudge against him, right... 
that makes sense why you wouldn't say he's evil then, but I think I think we're in the clear. I think Hachimaru has has fully understood that the problem he had with Anne was caused by himself and him seeing her as just his princess and not as a human being in in whom he he harbors feelings for. And so I think that this was a, a really good chapter for for the two of them and for their development. Also, um, the stuff that Anne says about her brother at the end, I'm kind of interested in. I can't wait for next week to see that fleshed out a little more, and I think that's going to that's gonna help out this, this understanding a little bit more as we go further here in Samurai 8. But I love Samurai 8. I'm a big Masashi Kishimoto fan. I have all of the Naruto volumes sitting on my bookshelf right here, so I definitely am a huge fan of Kishimoto. So... I love that he's writing this story, and I think he's he's great at it. And I hope he continues for for a, for a while. We are only on chapter thirty eight, but I really hope that this manga continues to go on and continues to be a great success for Weekly Shonen Jump. I think I think it has the potential to do that, and so I hope it does. But that's all of the manga that that only I read. Black Clover was on break this week, so there wasn't a Black Clover chapter, so we don't we don't have to go over that. Although what's happening in Black Clover right now is awesome, so definitely I would catch up on that um, if you haven't read that. But now we're gonna I'm gonna bring back Irrelevant, and we're gonna talk about some cancels, some weekly rankings, and we're gonna get into the the comments corner or whatever we're gonna call it co- countdown corner. We're gonna get into some of that, and we're gonna have a fun conversation. All right, so we're back here. Um, Irrelevant's back with us. Good to be back. So now is we're going to talk about how much we liked each chapter. So we're going to give our rankings. And for those of you watching this on YouTube, you're going to be able to see um, our different lists on the screen while, while we do this. But we're going to run down our list. And if there's something that we disagree with each other about or really want to talk about, we can. Um, but we're going to run through our list. Now, obviously, I read a lot more... Um, series than you do, and so I have put my series in the list. Um, you will see, for those of you watching, you're going to see the ones that only I read, I'm going to have in black text, and both of us, it'll be in the blue text for that both of us read. Um, but, I'm not going to mention those in the rankings, except to say, like, I had these in between these numbers. Um, so, I'll start by saying, my number 10 was Zip Man this week. What was your number 10? Likewise, Zip Man came in number 10 for me. My number 9 was Undead Unluck this week. Seems like we've got some stuff in common so far. Undead Unluck also coming in number 9. Number 8 is Mashley Magic and Muscles for me. Mm, I had A Gravity Boys as number 8. Fair. My number 7 was A Gravity Boys. (laughs) (laughs) And mine was Mashley, so... I'm surprised. Usually we're not this similar. Yeah, we're it's, it's, uncomfortable. it's going pretty pretty close here. My number six was My Hero Academia. Mine was Matama Security. Um, in between my six and five, I have Do- uh, Dr. Stone, which you don't read. But my five is Matama Security Spirit Busters. And my five is My Hero Academia. We've got a lot of, like, <laughs> just barely switches. So Good. in between my number five and number four, I have a lot. So... Um, in order, in descending order, so, you know, highest rank to lowest rank, is Jujutsu Kaisen, Demon Slayer, Chainsaw Man, and then Act Age, which brings us to my number four, which is Guardian of the Witch. Mine was Promised Neverland. And then my number three was The Promised Neverland. And mine was Guardian of the Witch. I swear we did not plan this. And usually we're in much greater disagreement about right. our rankings. My number two, Mission Yozakura Family. Same. Um, in between my two and one, I have Samurai 8, The Tale of Hachimaru. I thought it was really good this week, but you already heard that. Um, and my number one, uh, both of our number ones. One Piece. One Piece, absolutely. I, that seemed like a really easy decision. I mean, this One Piece chapter was awesome. Yeah, that was... No shade to Oda, but I think this is the best chapter we've gotten from him in a while. Like, not that I haven't enjoyed his other chapters. Like, it's been a good story, obviously. Like, right. even a good arc. But, like, this chapter, I'm like, nice, Oda. Yeah, I think it's all that build-up, all the 
you know, everything that we've seen in the flashback so far is building up to this moment that we're seeing right now. And that's just, you know, we're getting the payoff that we that we had. Yeah, and I appreciate that. It's, it's a good payoff, too. I don't think we really talked about this much earlier, but we've been building up to this moment. And it's definitely, it's not an overhyped moment. Like, it is every inch, every pound of hype that I anticipated receiving, I am, I am getting. So let's talk about the few disagreements that we had. So uh, you and I switched Mitama Security and My Hair Academia. Why did you put MHA above Mitama this week? Do you have like a reason or just the feel? So it was just the Mitama episode. So they both I didn't find particularly good or like interesting this round. But My Hair Academia was a little more so because we were like furthering a fight scene. Mitama, we had a salmon attempting to recruit people for his empire it's and a really just, funny salmon though he's a funny salmon but I'm, I'm a little concerned with how much he's going to be here you know my running gag goes this commentary so if we're trying to replace him i'm i'm out um yeah i just i you know i like the salmon a lot that's why i switched it probably but then the promised neverland and guardian of the witch we switched you put guardian over the promised neverland why'd you do that so that was a that was a closer call because I thought there was some really cool stuff, but I felt a little more hype about the guardian, a new guardian and a new witch coming into play than I did about the confrontation with Peter Rattree coming up. So it, I guess it's not so much the chapters themselves, but what they're setting us up for. I'm more excited to see this new guardian and this new witch than to see the showdown with Peter Rattree because I feel like it's going to be a little anticlimactic. Yeah, I think I think for me the reason I had it like it is is I just like the Promise Neverland more. I think like I just feel and you know that's just probably based on time. Like I've spent more time with the Promise Neverland than I have Guardian of the Witch, and so you know, give it some time, maybe I'll feel different. But oh yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I think. I think it's like a base feeling, you know. Yeah, I mean, comparing manga, I like the Promise Neverland better as a series as a manga, but comparing specific chapter, yeah. And so we each came up with then three series, and we'll do this every week too. I, I'm sorry. Did you have anything else to say about the rankings or anything like that? No, I think they covered it. I... Zip man's at the bottom, one B's at the top. <laughs> and that's all there is to be said. And that's all there is to be said. But um, So every week we're going to talk about things that we think are going to end or should end um, or should get canceled. Um, and so we each will come up with three manga to talk about every week. They could probably, honestly, they probably will be the same manga. And if so, we probably just won't, we'll say less about them. But we've come up with three this week. So what is your number three? So you're least likely of the three to get canceled. So I went not just with like to get canceled, but of what would be ending. So my number three is Promise Neverland. Just because, you know, eventually, like, if you throw the dart at the board enough times, it's going to stick. We know that Promise Neverland is coming to its end. I'd give it maybe, you know, if a chapter comes out every week, like another month or two. So I just see the end coming. I don't want it to end, but I feel it reaching its end. Sure, sure. Uh, my number three is actually also the Promise Neverland for the same reason. I think I'm, I I'm going to be satisfied, you know. I think it's time. But, you know, at the same time, it is sad to see it go. So it's hard to know when it's time because, I mean, chapter-wise, like, One Piece has had so many more chapters, but it's not time for that thing to end. Sure. I, that, yeah. <laughs> that behemoth has no end. Yeah. So, um, my number two, um, unfortunately you don't read, so we, we won't talk a whole lot about this, but my number two is Demon Slayer for a similar reason as The Promised Neverland. It's just, it's time for it to end. I Really good manga. Definitely should read it if you don't, but, um, but it's, you know. We're in the we're in the final fight, I think, honestly. But so so that's kind of what's your number two though? I'm sure we have more. My number two is Undead Unluck. I I want to like the characters. I want to like what's going on, but but I don't, and I feel like I'm not alone in that opinion. And so I kind of want it to end. That's fair. And, that's fair. And I just I don't see it like going too much like longer on unless they do something really good like I don't know it's not pulling me in. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. But so it's um then we'll we'll move on to the number one. I believe that our number ones 
are are the same. But number one, your number one was what? Zip Man. Yeah, that's mine too. Yeah, I. <clears throat> Similar to my number two explanation, it's just I wouldn't mind seeing it end. Like it's not to me, it's not very enjoyable. It's not very good. I think it needs to end. I think it's taken up space in Shonen Jump that it doesn't need to be taken up. It's not very... It's just so, I think, cliche. I think that the art... I think this is a great artist. And they should... <clears throat> they should draw for some for another manga, I think. And I think that that could be really good. But I just... I don't think that the story elements are there. It's just such a generic story to me, it feels like. That I just... I'm almost like, oh man, I wish you would make space for some other story. You know... Another kind of story. We have a lot of shonen action stories going on right now. And so I think, you know, make space for some other stories to, to really take shape. And, you know, that's why it's on my top. And I think it's not. I mean, it's, a, it's consistently at close to the bottom of the, the table of contents every week. So, I, I, you know, I don't think it's doing that well in the magazine either. So, yeah, but we'll fair. see. You know, time will tell. But that leads us to what I hope will become my favorite part of this of this podcast, which is the countdown corner, which I'm now wondering if that's actually that good of a name for this section, as it's more of like a conversation. I feel like it's um, random rankings. Yeah, yeah. So this week was your you you came up with the topic. So irrelevant, why don't you tell us what, what the topic is? Okay. So, first to explain the general concept is we're picking sort of arbitrary or, like, interesting areas in which to compare or, or rate, rate or rank characters from the different shows. And so, with all the, the talk on social media about it lately, I thought it would be kind of funny to rank, you know, of all the women in manga, who, so anyone, any female character is fair game. Who would, um, who would win The Bachelor? And so we came up with a list of our top three who would win. You better be ready to defend your picks because I'm ready to defend my picks. All right. So am I starting this, or are we starting with number three? Yeah. Let's start with Let's start with number three. Let's start with number three. Okay. We'll talk. We'll talk about your number three first. So I will. Admit a little caveat before anyone comes at me and goes, how could you not list XYZ character? As soon as I started thinking of this list, I blanked on, like, every female character that's ever existed in all the shows I read. It's going to be tough for you. But I pulled some out. So my number three on the brain recently is, um, I believe her name is Lemon from Mashley, Magic, and Might. (laughs) What? Muscles, you mean? Magic and Might. I mean, kind of. It's the same (laughs) principle. Lemon. Lemon. I think Irvine is her last name. Lemon yeah. Irvine. So I put her in there because, you know, I see her as just based on her limited interaction with Mesh, she's ready to fall and she's ready to work for it and to be cute doing it. So I just see her as a worthy competitor. She's my number three. I don't know. I think she's too soft, you know? I think what I'm talking about is when the drama starts in the house. Is Lemon going to be able to withstand withstand the drama? I don't see it happening. I mean, she's a witch. I think she's got or she's got some magic abilities. So I think we can be brewing up some love potions. You know, you got to think about that. Oh, is that a thing? I mean, we don't know. We don't know, but if this is truly you... my Harry Potter knockoff universe, then yes. I'm just saying you... It's a lot of guesswork we're doing for Lemon. I just compared to other people. I put them in the rankings, but... Okay. Are we ready for mine? Mm-hmm. My number three... Is Emma from the Promised Neverland? Thoughts. Well, I guess I should defend it first because you defended it first. Yeah. So Emma is amazing, you know, and anybody should pick Emma. I like the people are, that are higher on my list are only higher on my list because I think that they would actually do better. But I think that Emma should win in a perfect world. Emma is amazing. She is super intelligent. She is super positive all the time. She's a great person, and she should win. Is what I is is my argument for Emma. See, 
<clears throat> I love Emma, so I would support that, and I would make her, like, I would put her in the running. But here's the thing. I had to take in, you know, the fact that she is so good-hearted, so she's not willing to do any dirty tricks. But then also the fact that she's really smart, and that, not saying that there can't be smart people on The Bachelor, but <laughs> I don't <Whoa>. think... <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> no, and that's not even what I'm trying to say. I just wanted to make sure this was clear, but, like, guys don't tend to go for the smart chick. That's He's got time. They'll go on dates. And she's a genius. So I feel like the Bachelor's going to be intimidated by that. Wow. Wow. But that's, so, okay, that's why she's my number three, though, is because I agree with you that she wouldn't win, but I'm saying that she should. And so she had to make my list because I think she should win. Okay, all right, maybe, maybe. Um, so that number two. What's your number two? Uh, my number two is Mitsumi from um, Mitsumi Yozakura from Mission Yozakura family. And here is very specifically why she is number two. I think she is beautiful. I think she is talented and crafty enough to use all of her training to get to that position to win The Bachelor. Oh, yeah. However, I also believe that she is a crazy older brother who has definitely threatened every producer and has said, hey, I want my sister in second place so she feels good, but not first place because she's going home with nobody. And so I think he and uh, The Bachelor's had a little talk, and that is truly why she's number two, but not number one. That's... I'm upset about that. Just tell me her brother wouldn't rig the system. You Here's the know. deal. Here's the deal, though. The I Bachelor's was, dead if she wins. I was operating under the assumption that there is no... We've plucked these characters out of their natural habitat and placed them in the Bachelor show. So there's no older brother thing. That's what... Because that's going to be important when we get to my list. I mean, I guess it's fair that we have to step out of the world a little bit because, I mean, then we have to question why Emma, you know, 14-year-old Emma, is on The Bachelor. Yeah, we just aged her up. It's fine. So imagine her age up. It's fine. But I, I was taking them as who they are in world. We just put them all in the same universe and put them on The Bachelor, and I just, I felt the older brother coming in and being like, Bachelor, break her heart, I'll break your face. I will say that if Kyoichiro is a factor... She is definitely number two. You're absolutely correct about that. If Kyoichiro is in this game, she's number two. Because you're right. She's got to feel good about herself. But also, she she can't win. Yeah. So I, th I think you're onto something there. My number two is Nico Robin. Here's why. She is older. As in, like, just the exact right age that you're looking for for The Bachelor. She's older than 20, but younger than 30. Perfect. Then, she's also, I mean, all the women in One Piece look exactly the same. But, I mean, other than hair, they, they are the same. And Robin actually has the same hair as, like, three other characters. So, but, she obviously is very attractive, right? And, she is wicked intelligent, but she's not, like, Emma intelligent. Like, IQ intelligent. She's, like, real people intelligent. And so I'm saying when that drama starts kicking, Nico Robbins got it taken care of. And she is going to come out looking like the best choice every time. And that's why I put her at number two. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save any argument against that for when we get into my number one. Because, well, you'll see once I tell you who my number one pick is. Okay, well, so go ahead. Go ahead. Let's into? go to the number one then. So my number one, because I did think, I was like, I was thinking, my, my number one, someone's coming from One Piece, right? And so I was comparing the two of Nami, who is my number one, and Robin. And here I think are the distinct differences in their motivation. I think, one, I don't think Robin would have any desire to win that. I think Nami... You've got so many factors in this that I just have not applied to the situation. I feel like, I feel like such a loser. I didn't think about any of this. I, was, I wasn't in it to win it. I didn't want to win The Bachelor. What a fool. I'm in to win it. My fantasy Bachelor team is going gonna, is gonna to kick it. <laughs> so anyway, so so I don't think Robin has desire to be there. I think Nami does because Nami is definitely after that coin. 
you know, oh, yeah. for participating, whatever but if the he's a rich, for winning. What if he's a poor bachelor? Wealthy. Okay. <laughs> is the bachelor ever that poor? No. Oh, so maybe. Even, she's good at, at deceit and trickery. She's real cute. And so Can't I deny think. That. She's also 19, though. So she's 20? young, but still yeah, actually, legal. It's the right, it's the right that's age. That's definitely a, that's good, a good age for that category. And that's, so that's where, I just, I don't think Robin has any motivation. Also, Robin's personality, not that I don't think that she could be a spy, like, I don't think she could fake it, but I think her natural disposition is just a little, like, more gloomy, a little more serious, not necessarily, oh, yeah. like, the fun-loving chick you want to go on a date with. Yeah, but, like, Nami will cut you. I guess that's probably good for the drama, though. It's good for the drama, and I think she could tone it down to scam. I mean, that's what she did. She scammed Luffy. She scammed everyone. Yeah, I guess. Okay, so my number one is Mitsumi Uzakura, and I, I said that because she, because of the spy thing. I think she would do the best in the competition, but I was not factoring in Kyoichiro as, as an existence, an entity in this world. And that was your first mistake. Clearly. Clearly I have not factored in several factors. But, so that's why she's my number one. My real number one, that's my like fake number one, right? My real number one is Chiyoko, but you don't watch Axe Age, so you don't know who that is. But with her appearance, she has literally already crafted her life to be perfectly acceptable to all male audiences. So, I feel like she wins. Every time, but you haven't seen that, so I kind of left her off the list. So Mitsumi is my, you know, number one. Yeah, she might be. I also want to add in, because you might assume if you're <clears throat> listening to a podcast about Shonen Express, I must assume that you read One Piece, because who doesn't read One Piece? You should. If you're not, do it. Do it now. There's a lot of catch-up work, but it's worth it, I promise. Do it right now. <laughs> Don't Get sleep. Don't it. sleep until it's done. Your best life starts now. Wow. Yikes. <laughs> Okay, let's not go that far. Um, but you might be thinking, why is Boa Hancock not your number one? And we we decided as, as a unit here that um, the producers, upon learning that if you were to uh, look at her lustfully, you're going to turn into stone, they realized that would probably put a damper on the Bachelor festivities. So she sure. was not she was not permitted to enter the competition. You would go through several Bachelors, at least. Yeah, you know, people started withdrawing their names for consideration. It was a, it was a whole thing. So. It's really, you know, it's upsetting, you know. She's just looking for love, but, you know, who knows? Maybe one is day she, Luffy will call her. Is she looking for love? <laughs> no. From Luffy. She's she, looking for that she's Luffy. She's looking for Luffy's love, particularly. <laughs> yes. Ain't no love, like, unrequited love, you know what I'm saying? A lot of rubber jokes could be made there, but we will... Uh... We will ignore all of those. And on that note. <laughs> but, um, so, that's that's our list. That's our batch. Who would win the Bachelor list? I clearly have learned that I need to consider f many more factors when when discussing these topics. Yeah, you can't come into the Random Ranks Corner and act like that. You gotta, you gotta know your Ooh, facts. Random Ranks Corner. That's the name. That's it. That's perfect. That's I didn't even think about that. I'm writing it down right now, for real. <laughs> you know, my name might be irrelevant, but I got good ideas. Yeah, so, um, that's that's all I had. Is that, do you got anything else you got to talk about? No, I think we're good, but definitely leave comments. I want to know what your rankings are. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Like, your chapter rankings, and who do you think is going to win The Bachelor? I want the lists. No real answers. We don't have to talk about The Real Bachelor. I just want to know... Bring me your best manga character. Yeah, yeah. Who's coming to the table? To clarify, I don't care who Pete the pilot ends up with. I need to know what fictional cartoon character Pete the pilot would end up with. That's what I want you to tell me. You know, if I had known Pete was a pilot, I may have said unluck just for the comedy, but... Why would you... You want Pete to die? <laughs> what? No, because she was just on a plane that blew up. It was a whole thing. That was... That would have definitely killed Pete. Pete's done. Pete's well, beat one explosion and Pete's out. You know, the things we do for love, you know what I mean? All right. So on that note, you know, exploding planes, we will um, end, end the podcast. Thank you all for listening. 
um, to the very first Shonen Express podcast. I'm really excited about continuing to do this. I, I don't know about you, Irrelevant. Um, oh, you know. No, I'm really excited, too. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, so I'm excited about what's coming up, you know, in the coming weeks and being able to do this podcast, coming up with new uh, random rank corner categories to, to talk about and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm excited to do that. Definitely like um, the video if you liked anything we had to say. Subscribe to the channel for more podcasts. Um, as well as leave your comments down there. Like we said, we'd love to hear what your ranks are, whether for The Bachelor or for, you know, how these chapters did this week. We'd love to hear from you. Um, but with that, this is Shonen Express and Irrelevant signing off. See you next week.